you have a good break? Yeah, I mean, could have been better. Had to go to court. Lawyers aren't cheap. They are not. Yeah. Money's a little tight right now. <laughs> you know why, right? Because you keep letting people borrow it. That's your problem. Uh-huh. Okay. All right. Uh, class stuff. We're almost at, the, almost at the end. Homework five, again, is due December 4th. Project four is due uh, seven days later on the 11th. Um, the Snowflake lecture next Tuesday in class, or sorry, next Tuesday's class on December 6th, that will be virtual. Uh, we'll have some former CMU students that, that are at Snowflake building their system, which is relevant to your discussion today. They will be calling in over Zoom. I'll send out details and post that on Piazza. So we can sit in here and watch Zoom on the big screen. That seems kind of weird. Uh, so let's just do it from your dorms or house or whatever, okay? And then, the, as I posted on Piazza this weekend, the call-in lecture will be uh, on December 8th. That will be in person, but then people can call in, or you guys can ask questions live. And it'll be, again, anything that you want to have questions about throughout the entire semester about databases, uh, we, we can answer. Right? So I posted a form on, on Piazza. You can, if you have a sort of complex question uh, that you want sort of a multi-part answer, then, then you know, submit it ahead of time. Otherwise, we just shoot from the hip. We'll bleep out anything that should be bleeped. I guess it's live. You can't. Um, but yeah, so we'll keep it somewhat professional. But yeah, any database question, go for it, okay? And then the final exam will be on Friday, December 16th. Any questions about any of these things? Okay. So we've gotten some great feedback. Uh, uh, for emails again. Uh, actually, first one's about you. Uh, so this guy wrote in and said that you're, you're fine, but do you got to stop giving money to people, which is relevant to what we just talked about, right? Too many people owe you money. So there's that. Um, but then I got this other email from this guy uh, who is an old school database veteran. And I said in the last class when we talked about distributed OLTB systems, I mentioned that, oh, two-phase commit. Nobody really knows where it came from. And I, because I thought Jim Gray invented it. And then I found something, something else. Um, but then he pointed out in the Jim Gray textbook, there's this paragraph here where there really isn't like a, a notable inventor of two-phase commit because they just said it's just contract law. We get two people to agree to something and then you go ahead and commit that, you know, commit the, tr the contract. And so there was this Italian guy, uh, Nico Garzada. He's, he's, he's sort of credited as first implementing a security system. But then in, in Jim Gray, he's the first one at documenting it. So that's why I thought Jim Gray invented it, but actually predates that. And there's this, it's page 575 in this book here, uh, which is like sort of the transaction Bible written by Jim Gray. It's just like, this is from 1992. It's a bit, you know, it doesn't have like RAF, doesn't have Paxos, but the core concepts of when we talk about currency control and some of the distributed execution stuff uh, can be found in this, this book here. It's, it's fantastic. So again, I like when, this is why I put things on YouTube, because uh, if I'm wrong, people point it out and send emails. Or he, he has problems, people send emails too, which is good. All right. So uh, today we're going to be talking about OLAP systems. And the, you know, we have this distinction between the OTP systems where you're ingesting new information from the outside world, you're running transactions, you're updating your database. And then now with the analytical system, now we actually want to analyze the, the, all this data we collected from these OTP systems uh, and, ex and extrapolate new knowledge. And so this is not specific to distributed databases. Or, uh, this, what I'm about to describe here is not specific to distributed databases. Um, I just want to show you here's, when you got in the real world, Here's how you're probably going to come across these two, two different systems. And the OLAP system could be distributed. It could be a single node. The OTP system could be single node or distributed. It doesn't matter. So you would have this bifurcated system where you have all your OTP databases. And this is where, again, this is where people are going through the application, to the website, the, the phone app, whatever it is. They're, they're making updates. They're, they're looking at things. And they're hitting up these databases. But now what I want to do is I want to analyze and, and, and find some, you know, run data science algorithms or whatever I want to run to extrapolate new knowledge on all these, these, these different databases. But I don't want to do it on the front end nodes themselves because if I run a really, really expensive analytical query, that's going to take locks and slow down transactions and interfere with people using the application. So typically, people want to, want to separate these two. And so what you would have is a, a process called ETL, extract, transform, and load. There's a bunch of tools to do this kind of stuff. You might have heard of like Fivetran, uh, Golden Gate from Oracle. Right? There's a bunch of tools that know how to take the data out of these OTP systems, do some kind of cleanup, and then shove it into your backend da data warehouse. And so the, the reason why you have to do this sort of this cleanup process and the transform process, because oftentimes the, the schema 
or the naming of things in these different OTB databases will be different from one database to the next. So the example I always like to use is Zynga, right? Zynga buys a lot of these different phone apps and they usually leave the front end database alone. But now if you want to run analytics across all your different, you know, the, the different games you have, the data you collect from people, you've got to clean up the schema and make things be uniform, right? Because like one database might have, you know, say a, 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 a table of users, they might have the, you know, the first name, the name of the column be F name or first underscore name or first name with by itself, right? So from a database system perspective, those are see, seen as different com or column names or different attributes. Because we in humans, they know it's, it's corresponding to the same thing. So you would clean this up in the transform phase. And so you put it into uh, a standardized schema, right? There's another style of, uh, that's becoming more common now. We'll see a little bit in a second in a data lake where instead of doing extract, transform, and load, you do uh, extract, or ELT, extract, load, and transform. So you just dump all your files into a data lake. And then when you run your queries, you go ahead and clean things up and put it to the sort of a standardized schema. Right, so ETL is the classic way of doing this, but uh, ELT is, 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 the more, is becoming more common now. But again, the main thing I want to show, just say is that you, you would have separate systems for these things. So now, we didn't really talk about what these OLAP databases are, what the, the database itself is going to look like at a logical level. Right, we talked about it, it being a column store. We talked about it could be a shared disk system, a shared nothing system. Um, we talked about how we execute parallel queries. But how you would actually model your data in an OLAP system is going to be slightly different. Or the preferred way of doing it is slightly different than how you do this in OTP system. And so I'm using the word OLAP. Sometimes you see these things called DSS or decision support systems or analytical systems or data science systems. They're all more or less mean the same thing, right? The idea is that like you're, you, this is the repository. You're going to store all your data you've collected over the entire history of your application and you want to find new things, right? So the, there's basically two approaches to doing this, uh, or two sort of two different modeling approaches. There's a star schema and a snowflake schema. And everyone wonder where, like, why snowflake called snowflake, right? Because they support snowflake schemas, right? So let's go through the star schema first. This is a uh, this would be a sort of simplified form, and then snowflake will be an expansion of it. So the in an OLAP system. The way to sort of model them, a common, a common approach to modeling them is this idea of a fact table and dimension tables. So remember before when I talked about uh, schemas, it was like, oh, you could have, you know, you would have a table for customers and customers have orders and orders have order items, right? That's sort of like a tree structure. And that's very common in OTP systems. But in analytical systems, oftentimes what you want to do is just do some analytics on a giant fact table and then you do joins against these dimension tables to fill in supplemental information, right? So say in a really simple like Amazon warehouse, a data warehouse, you have a fact table of all the sales of, of, that ever occurred in, in Amazon or Walmart, whatever it is, like every single item anyone's ever bought. So the thing is like you know, billions and billions, maybe probably in trillions at this point, like this, this giant table of just like a line, there's, a, there's an entry, a tuple for every single item ever, anybody's ever bought. And then instead of in, in lining in this fact table, instead of having like, here's the product name, here's the product price and, and so forth, right? Or you, would, you, would have price, you wouldn't have the product name or like the location of the user and all these different things. You would store that in fo as foreign keys to these dimension tables that sort of span out or emanate out from the, the fact table, right? So you would have a dimension table. You say, here's the, the product category, sorry, product dimension table. Here's the product category. Here's its name, its description. Here's a location of information where the person bought the, bought the, bought the, uh, bought the, um, the item where the user is. Here's like a time dimension to say, instead of saying here's the exact timestamp of maybe when somebody bought something, I want to group it up by like per hour, per day, per week, per month, and so forth. And then same thing for additional information about, about the customer itself, right? So you have all these different foreign keys. So now when you, when you run, want to run analytics and say find the, find the, 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 what are the top 10 items that people bought that live in this location at this time under these conditions, you're basically scanning through the dimension table and joining with the, the dimensions, right? So you would go look up the product dimensions and, and do a join on that. And you would use the join algorithms that, we, that we've talked about so far, right? So the challenge, so this is, the reason why this, this is a good idea because the earlier OLAP systems, the early analytical systems, again, whether they were distributed or not, they weren't really good at doing, you know, 
joining a lot of different tables, right? Like, you know, doing more than five joins, the, the, the query plans usually get pretty bad. So if you can simplify it and denormalize the tables down into a simple fact table and then in one outer ring dimension tables, you'll get better performance for your joins because the, the joins are more simplified. Yeah. So his question is, are we, uh, how does it simplify the, 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 how does it simplify the schema? Are we merging this and making yeah, one? You still have like five tables here, right? Yeah, so, so his question is like, you still have five tables here. Uh, like think of like if I had, uh, you know, if I had say, 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 say the product one, right? I could have one for a, a table for category and that would be a separate table. Another table for the product would be a separate category or a separate table. Like you just you span out everything. You have like it'd be multiple levels going out. You just condense it down so you have one level of dimensions going out. The alternative is what what I was referring to now is it would be the snowflake schema, where you do exactly what I just said. You expand it out and have multiple dimensions going out like this. Right? You still have this giant fact table, you still have the thing you're gonna basically do a sequential scan on and then try to do joins as quickly as possible against the dimension tables to find the data that you're looking for. Uh, but now you're allowing for, for, for you know, multiple levels of, of foreign keys coming out of this, right? So in case of the product table, again, instead of having the category information and the product information in a, as a single denormalized table, it's now, it's now normalized and broken out, right? Okay, so this seems kind of weird. That, like, this is a, it's a different way of thinking how to design a, a database, which we haven't really talked about how to do data, data modeling. Th that's done in Heinz College. Um, the, but now we can see, now we can build a database system that's optimized for ripping through a huge fact table and doing these joins quickly as possible. All right, so the first issue with, with these different approaches are, is, is the normalization or denormalization issue. We don't talk about the normal forms in this class because when you go out in the real world, you'll never see it. Uh, we used to teach it. We don't teach it anymore. It's a waste of time, in my opinion. It's basically this idea of like how how much can I break up tables into you know, sort of different pieces and then have foreign keys between them, right? And the reason, and there's this, there's this, there is a, a whole bunch of theory and, and previous work done on like, what's the optimal way to break this up? And again, nobody follows these, these, these different rules. It just, it just sort of happens naturally. But then you would have maybe a database administrator know that if I'm gonna set up a database to be for, my, for analytical workloads, I would follow sort of this either the snowflake schema or the star, uh, snowflake schema or the star schema paradigm and model things that way. But the issue is if you de start denormalizing and try to create, create giant tables so you don't have to do these, these, these multi-way joins going out dimensions, then you end up with a lot more redundant information. Uh, and now it's respon you're responsible in the application to make sure that everything's always correct, right? Whereas in the relational model, the idea was, was we'd break up these atomic pieces so we, we minimize the amount of redundant information we have so that if we update a category name, everybody sees that update uh, correctly. Right? All, the, all the things pointing to that table would see that update rather than we have to update multiple entries. Again, and then the other issue is again, the complexity for, for Snowflake schemas, you require more joins to get the data needed for the query, whereas star schemas will be usually require fewer ones and therefore be potentially faster and have more accurate statistics and get better query plans. This is still an issue in modern systems, uh, but for the most part, uh, people did the star schema stuff late 90s, early 2000s. Since then though, everyone reckon, in, to support the flexible nature of the Snowflake schema, most OLAP systems, or pretty much every OLAP system at this point, will support them. It used to be that you, didn't, you couldn't support you know, multi-dimensions out. They would, they would restrict you to a star schema. Every, every modern system today will support Netflix schema. This is what people normally do. Again, I'm just going to expose you to this to say like, hey, look, you'll see this in the real world. You'll see data warehouses have this giant fact table and these dimension tables. This, this is a common setup. And again, we can design our OLAP system to rip through things really quickly. And this is why a column store would be super useful because if, going back here, if, I only, if I'm trying to find all the items bought within a given location, then if I'm scanning the fact table, I only need to look at maybe the location foreign key to do, and do that lookup. I don't care about these other columns, right? So there's a lot of optimizations that, that we can apply for this. All right, so here's the problem we're trying to handle today. We have an application server, we have a bunch of data. Uh, we wanna run some join query. Uh, we wanna join table R with table S, 
right? And let's say that both of these two tables are partitioned on, on some, some column. We don't know what it is at this point. And we need a way to, to produce this result, right? And so the data is scored across the different partitions, but we need to produce a single result as if it was sitting on, on a single logical node, right? So the easiest thing we could do is just to take the, the data from the different partitions that are stored different nodes and copy them or transfer them over the network to the, this one node, then do my join on RNS and produce the result. It'd work, it would, it would be correct, uh, but this is obviously stupid and defeats the whole, per, the, whole, the whole point of having a distributed database, right? Because I'm not taking advantage of these additional resources. I mean, I'm showing them as a database drum, but it could be these additional CPUs over here. So maybe I could run the, the, the joins in parallel. Uh, I'm also assuming that the node up here has enough you know, memory or even enough disk to store all these different uh, partitions of data, right? So what we really need to be able to do is you need to be able to take a query that is trying to scan a lot of data, farm it out to a bunch of different nodes, have those run in parallel, and then coalesce the results and put things back together. And joins are the main thing we're, we're going to worry about because we want to make sure that we don't have any false negatives. We don't want to be the case where, uh, you know, there's some value in R that we try to join S and there is a match that it does exist, but because we sent the, the portion of the query to the wrong node, or we, don't, we didn't send the data to the right location, we end up coming back with incorrect results. So we, we want to avoid that. So today we're going to talk about different execution models for distributed OLAP systems. We'll talk about how basically at a high level, how we're going to do, do uh, query planning. Then we're going to focus most of our time on doing distributed joins, because again, that's the most important thing we do. Um, and we spend most of our time in the system doing that. And then we'll finish up talking about cloud systems and data lakes and just sort of expose you to uh, these different concepts and how the, you know, people say data lake, it's not radically different, something brand, brand new. It's just an application of distributed, distributed OLAP system technology or ideas applied to a bunch of random files in S3. Okay? Okay. I'll say also too, the, um, you know, just because we're running our data in the cloud doesn't mean we don't care about all the things we talked about this semester. Right, we care about performance, we care about data correctness, uh, integrity, constraints, and all those things. Like, just because you're in the cloud doesn't make, th make things magically, magically better, right? We still have to worry about all the same things, but now somebody else is running our hardware for us. All right, so the first design decision we have to make is whether we want to uh, do a push or versus pull for the data. I think we talked about this before, uh, but this matters a lot now for, for OLAP systems because we're reading a lot of data. So the, the first approach is to push the query to the data. And the idea is that we want to send a, the, the, the instructions of the test to execute some part of the query to the location where the data is actually being stored. Now, if it's a shared disk system, we can't always do that because like S3 doesn't expose you know, raw CPU where you can run whatever task you want on that. Uh, so it may be the case with the pull the data out to a, to a compute node and then run some portion of the query there, but we don't want to have to do what I showed before where copy all the data to, to a single node, right? We want, we want to break things up as much as possible. So the main goal here is the same thing we talked about before when we did query planning, is that we want to try to filter out and throw away as much useless data as possible before we start transferring the data. And so this is ideal if you can push the query to the data because we can do as much processing as, as we can to filter things out before we have to send it over the network to some other node or back to the client. The alternative is the reverse of this is the pull data to the query, right? And again, this is, as I was saying, was like we have the data stored somewhere else and we have to copy it to where we're gonna run and, and, and compute the intermediate result or compute the result there, right? So the, an obvious way to think about this is, okay, I, I, want, I wanna run, I usually wanna pull the, sorry, I usually wanna push the query to the data because the, the size of the query itself is going to be small relative to the amount of data I have to access or send around, right? Most SQL queries, you know, maybe, you know, a couple, couple tens of hundreds of, of kilobytes. The largest, like, like the actual SQL string itself, the largest SQL string I know about I've ever seen is some from Google. They told me they had one query, like one query itself was 10 megabytes, right? Because it's, like, it's like a dashboard. You click a bunch of stuff and there's these, these giant in clauses, right? Um, that's not the entire story though, because again, if you don't have a way to run any code or run that query, then you can't, you know, you can't push the query to the data. Um, and so the lines get actually kind of blurred in the cloud 
because uh, some of the cloud vendors for their distributed cloud storage, object storage, will actually let you do push the query to the data in these, a limited fashion. Then it does some local filtering, and then you pull it to the node where you actually want to run it and do further processing on it. So in Amazon S3, they have this thing called S3 Select, where you can actually send simplified select queries uh, on a request to S3 when you get data, and they will actually run your query uh, and, and examine the data locally before it sends you out the, the result. Um, and, and they natively support parsing CSV files, JSON files, uh, even Parquet, which is a, a column, column store file we'll talk about in a second. Uh, Microsoft has something similar for their uh, Azure Blob storage, right? You, you can post a request to Azure Blob. It, that's a select statement, and it'll do some localized filtering. I looked, and I don't think Google actually supports this. So this, again, this is what I'm saying. The lines are kind of blurred. It's a shared disk architecture, but you can push some portion of the query to the data. Exadata does this, or Oracle does this with Exadata, where they actually have FPGA accelerators on the on the shared disk storage layer itself. It's like a separate rack, and they can push some like do like projection push down or pre predicate push down. When they send requests for pages, they can actually send the filter as well, and then the system only sends back pages that have matches. Again, so the, the way I think about this is like, I want to get page one, two, three. Uh, I pass along the select, like, you know, only give me this data if there's a match for this, uh, you know, f you know, f this, this record. And then it will, I think for all of these, they will filter out anything you don't need and just send back the data. I might be wrong about that. They might have to send back the whole block. Just, and then you have to get into additional processing to find the thing that actually matched. But the idea, this is ideal if you can not bring back data you, you're never going to need because you let, you let Amazon or you let Microsoft do, do the filtering for you. All right, so here's just, you know, another way to illustrate what, I, what I've talked about. So here's the push the query to the data. Assuming we're a shared nothing system, my query shows up. I want to do this join. Uh, I partition P1 and P2 uh, on two different nodes. Or sorry, I partition R and S on two different nodes. So I would send the query to the first node. The first node says, I know I need to do a join uh, on R and S, but I don't have all the data. So let me push down a, a plan fragment down to this node and say, hey, by the way, do join on R and S for these IDs that I know you have, and then this sends back just the result. Right? It's good. It ran the computation locally, sends back the result. The, uh, the, the, nodes, the first node is responsible for, for combining the results and then sending it back to the, to the client. Right? And we can do this because, again, we have, we have compute and memory here that, um, um, in a shared nothing system. So we can ac access our local disk and do this processing. Yes? Oh, so his question is like, how do I know that, how does the top node know the bottom node has the 101 to 200? No, like I was trying to say, um, is it not possible, like maybe not in this case, but is it not possible that like uh, two tables you have, the uh, IDs don't necessarily like match up, both don't have one to one. All right, so his question is, could it be the case that the, the ID, the range of the partitions don't match, like they don't have exactly one to 100, Worse, I mean, or even worse, what if like they're partitioned on completely different keys that aren't the joints? We'll get to that in a second. You have to handle that. Yes. Yes. Wait, but like even if we don't have the ID range and then we, the policy is just no will uh, return whatever data is contained on that node, it's still the same result, right? Because if we pa even if we pass in a full like 0 to 200, there's no way the second node can know anything about like 0 to so, so you're saying even even if we don't pass this, do a join on 101 to 200. Yeah, like no two can do a join from zero to 100. So essentially, it would just do a join from 100. Correct. Yes. So we don't necessarily need to pass the ID. That's just. I mean, uh, yeah. I, I doesn't matter. I think. Yeah. I, I, yeah. So. I mean, this assumes that you know, this assumes that you have range partitioning, so you know the boundaries, right? And so you know that ahead of time. If you're doing hash partitioning, which is, I think is more common than range partitioning, especially OLAP systems, that you wouldn't pass the ID range because you wouldn't have it. You, you just say, because it's random. I'm just, I'm, so yeah, so visually I'm trying to say like, okay, I'm going to do a join on the bottom node from 101 to 200. 
And then when I sends up the result, I union the, the, the join from the top node, union the join from the bottom node, and then that, that's the complete result. And I, I don't have any false negatives. Yes? Sorry, I have a, I have a, so I have a question is that like, that's a, like, when you do this, right, you're assuming that the, the memory on the node that the application, application server is calling can hold both the join result of the other node, uh, the, other, the other node, as well as the join result of your own node, right? Because what if it exceeds the own memory then? So my statement is, am I assuming in this case here that the, the top node has enough memory to, to store the intermediate result from its portion of the query and then the intermediate result from the, from the query on the bottom? Right. It doesn't, you don't have to, right? We can spill it a disk. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's all the same buffer pool stuff we talked about before. Okay, so pull the query to the data of the query. I'm showing this as a shared disk system, but again, doesn't doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, so query shows up. Uh, it sends down the, the again the plan fragment to the the bottom here. So this is actually pushing the the this be pushing the query to the data, um, and then each guy again go, goes out each each node goes out to the the, the shared disk storage, goes fetches the pages that it needs, gets back the result, computes the join locally. And then this guy sends the uh, sends the result up above. So this is actually this is actually doing both, right? This is pulling this is pushing the query from the top node to the bottom node, and then each node then pulls the data from the shares disk, does the process locally, and then sends it up. Question. What is pull data to query if you have shared nothing? What is pull data to the query if you have shared nothing? It'd be my example from before where you would you would you copy the data from wherever it's, where it's primarily residing to the node that actually needs to process it. And we'll see this, we have to do this when we do some joins. Right, so this is saying that this is not a, uh, this is, it's not, these are not mutually exclusive. You, you would use some combination of both of them. And again, the database system should be in the best situation to understand, okay, when the data is over here and I need to run the query here and I could, could run the query there, what's the right choice for me? Like what's, what's the most efficient, way, most efficient thing for me to do? Okay, so as, I mean, as I said before, the 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 data that that at the node that receives the yeah the the node the data that arrives at a node from the remote sources will be just cached in the buffer pool, and again we can page that out to disk, write that out to disk as needed if if we run out of memory, right? And we want to do this because you know for these really large OLAP queries that are maybe processing a lot of data, you know it might be one petabyte of data and we only have 100 gigs of RAM. All right, if we're processing a lot of intermediate results, we can't, uh, you know, we can't retain that all into memory, right? But now the problem is, is that if you have a long running query, uh, what do we do if one of the node crashes during execution? All right? Should we, in, in, when we talked about transactions before, you know, on a two-phase commit, if the, you know, the coordinator crashes or one of the nodes crashes, before we get farther, far enough along in the two-phase commit process, we would say, oh, the whole transaction aborted. And we just punt up, you know, throw an exception back to the client, and the client is responsible for actually then you know, rerunning the transaction. But now these, re these OLAP queries are running for like, for, you know, for minutes, hours, days, or it's less common than the old days it used to be uh, before the column stores. Um, like I had a friend that was early employee in Vertica. Uh, he went down to Australia to set Vertica up. Was it, Vertica was a column store system. Or is, it still exists. Um, they replaced for like the Australian phone company. They had some row store system that was taking like five days to run monthly, like you know, phone bills to generate the phone bills for customers. They switched over to Com Store, and now it took like hours. Now nowadays, the computing's got so much so good, and these systems got really good. You know, those kind of queries could probably take minutes or seconds. Um, you know, depending on the resources. But still, there there's a the query is not running in like 10 milliseconds as you would in a transaction. These are running for larger periods of time, and therefore, it is possible that, that the, the node could go down. But since we're not running updates, uh, we're not necessarily worried about correctness of the data. It's more about should we you know, restart the query or start over. So typically, in most of the, of the shared nothing systems, the traditional way of doing this is that as soon as a node goes down, you just say the whole query fails. Um, and the reason why they would make this decision, or this design choice, is because they don't want to pay the penalty of having to write out the intermediate results to disk 
as like checkpoints as you're running along, because uh, that'll slow things down. And you assume that your nodes aren't going to fail because your cluster is not that big. Uh, then it's not it's not worth paying that performance penalty. Uh, this has changed in the cloud setting where now the fan out could be quite large, uh, where now the system is actually going to maybe take these intermediate snapshots as you go along of the results, write them out to shared disk. So that way, if some node goes down uh, as, you're, as you're running a task or running the query, some other, you know, you'll spin up a new instance or new node who can then pick up where the other guy left off, right? But of course, again, you pay, you pay a, a performance penalty for this. So you want, you want to be a bit strategic about when you actually do it. So the basic idea is, is here. So say uh, I'm running on a shared disk system. My query shows up at this node. I send uh, you know, a, a portion of it, a portion of the join down here. Uh, and it's going to compute the result of the join. But maybe instead of sending it to the node at the top, it's going to write it out to shared disk. And then that way, if it crashes and goes away, the, the, the node at the top says, well, I know I asked this other guy to compute this join. I, let me go get it from shared disk, and that way I don't have to recompute it uh, from scratch. So uh, assuming most people have heard of Hadoop or MapReduce, um, it's not really, I mean, it's, it is a thing, but it's not how you would want to build a distributed OLAP system anymore. Um, but when that first came out, it was designed by Google, the original MapReduce model, and they were taking checkpoints, writing out the shared disk at every single step of, 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 a, of, a, of a, you know, query pipeline which is super slow, but they did this because Google was assuming they were running on you know, hundreds and hundreds of machines that at, at any time one could go down. And instead of having to restart the entire server, or re restart the entire query, you just you had the checkpoint on shared disks from HDFS and you picked it back up and kept running. Um, but in the modern systems, they're a bit more strategic, as I said, because you don't want to be writing everything all out, the disk, over, you know, every single step of the query pipeline. But again, you don't want to restart it if there's a crash. So there's sort of an in-between uh, there is a, there's a middle ground where you want to do some checkpointing, but not always, right? Okay. Next question is how we actually do query planning for this. So all the optimizations we talked about before, all the way we would do a search to find the right join order, predicate pushdown, projections, uh, all those techniques still apply in this world. The, the thing that changes, though, is now we have to be cognizant of the network cost of, of sending data from one node to the next. And so in the, in the query optimizer, before maybe we just cared about how many blocks I got to rewrite in the disk when I'm doing a join, but now I got to be aware of where the data is located and where, it's gonna, where the result's going to go or where it's going to come from. And I, I account for that in, in my costs. So again, it's, I said query optimization and query planning is hard. <laughs> Distributed query planning is even harder. And again, there's no magic bullet to make this work, All right? So there'll be some systems like DB2 where they were actually, when, this, as, as, when the system boots up, they'll run some quick micro benchmarks to see what's the latency between different nodes, and they can use that in their calculations for, for query costs. All right, so I showed before also, too, that there's one node sending a request down to another node, uh, and I said it was a, you know, a, a planned fragment, but I didn't really define what that actually physically looks like, right? So there's two approaches to, do, to, to send out plan fragments to d different nodes in a distributed system. The first is if we can send the physical operators, uh, like we showed before when we talked about pipelines, where I could break up the query plan into uh, successive physical operators and send that down. And then now the other system then just, just takes the query plan and executes it as, as defined on the data that, that it has local, right? And this is what most systems do, right? SQL query shows up once, you, you parse it, plan it, generate a uh, bunch of uh, query plan operators, break them up and assign them to different physical, physical nodes, and then send, send those out. An alternative is to take the SQL query on the, the, the node where the query shows up, parse it, plan it, generate physical operators, then convert it back into SQL again but for the different nodes that are going to be in the that, that are going to execute the query, and the idea here is that the if you if you do all your parsing at a single location or, or you're planning at a single location, the decisions will be made uh, the optimizer decision will be made on 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 whatever the statistics that they have collected at that node, which may not be accurate representation what's at the different nodes. So instead, if I can convert my 
my sort of plan fragment back into SQL, send that over to the node that's going to actually run that plan fragment. It can then run its own optimizer with its own local collected, locally collected statistics and potentially make better decisions because it has a local view of the data of how it actually want to, wants to produce the result. Right? So it may be the case that uh, for the second approach, I send the, the different SQL plan fragments to the different nodes. And one node says, my data looks like this. I want to use a sort merge join. Another, another node says, my data looks like this. I want to do a hash join. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter, right? Because as long as I get the correct results in the join when I, when I combine things, uh, but each node can make, it, can, again, can make its own local decisions about things. So the only two systems I know that do this is single store uh, and the test. Single store is a distributed, uh, now it used to be in memory, it used to be MemSQL, but now it's a distributed real-time analytical system. Uh, and when they send the, the SQL query, they actually annotate it with non-standard SQL constructs to say things like, hey, run the SQL query, and by the way, send the result to this other node here sending back to a single location. So you can, you can actually put hints in, into the, the SQL plan or the SQL statement itself to tell the local node where to send things. And then the test is a, um, is, uh, it's a middleware system that does distributed MySQL that came out of YouTube. And, what's that? Surprised by this? YouTube's huge, right? It runs MySQL. <laughs> This is a weird reaction. Why, why wouldn't they? Why would, you make it sound like they wouldn't have a big database? Okay, all right. Um, yeah, all right, so anyway, so, so it, they, it's been spun out as Planet Scale, which is a new startup. But again, same thing. They have the SQL query shows up. Uh, they generate the, the query plan and then for a distributed query plan, and then they convert it back to SQL because the different nodes in, in the cluster are just running bare bones my, or stock MySQL. So they can't accept query plans. They have to set, you know, they have, to, they have to run their own SQL statements. They have to take in SQL and run those. So the basic idea is this, right? So say if you're doing the, where you're sending SQL queries. So this is my original join. Uh, at the, this arrives at, at, at the planner node, but then my data is broken up into different partitions. So I would do, I would generate what the, 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 the physical query plan, distributed query plan that I want to run for this, this join. But then I'm going to uh, reverse it back into SQL and then send down each node uh, you know, a version of the, of the query that is targeted, that targets the data that they have, right? And then each node can then parse it, plan it, optimize it just like before, as if it was a single node query. And then they send back the results to a single location. Uh, and then some, there's some coordinator node that has to union all the results together. Okay. I would say also, too, the advantage of this is that you don't need to have super accurate statistics uh, at like the, the centralized coordinator node, right? Because again, these guys, are, each node is going to run analyze on, on the data that, that it's responsible for, and therefore it can make better decisions about how to do query optimization. Okay, so the the obviously the, the you know joins are our most important thing we want to do in an OLAP system. Um, and the efficiency of the joins is going to depend heavily to, going to heavily depend on what the query actually wants to do and what the uh, how the data is actually partitioned, right? And as I showed in the beginning, the easiest way to do a join is to put all the data from your different nodes back into a single node and run that. But of course, that that's not realistic. You can't, you know, it, it won't scale. So we need we need a better way to do this. So there's going to be four different scenarios we have to deal with to do a distributed join. And the basic idea is that we want to say just join two tables R and S, and we need to make sure that the, the right tuples from R and the right tuples from S are at the same location, at the same node, so that when we do a local join using all the join, any of the join algorithms that we, we talked about before, it usually will be hash join, uh, but it doesn't necessarily matter. But when we do the local join at the node, we're guaranteed that the data from R that would could potentially match to the data in S are located at the same node. Because otherwise, if like ID equals one for R is at this node, and ID equals one is at another node for S, then when I do the join, you're gonna get false negatives. Right? So we, we, we wanna avoid that. So again, so once we get the data at the right node, uh, again, we, we, and ideally we wanna keep this distributed, we can then run a local join algorithm, produce the results, and then send them back to some location to coalesce things. So we're going to go through four scenarios from best to worst case scenario. Um, and the technique will be roughly the same for 
or actually it will be the same whether it's a shared disk or shared nothing system, right? In, in the case of shared disk, it's just where do you send the, from the shared disk to, to what compute node? For a uh, shared nothing system, the, assume the compute node already has the data local, but it may need, may need to send it out some other location. All right, so like I said before, best case scenario to worst case scenario. Best case scenario is that the, uh, one of the tables that we want to join is replicated at every single node in, in the cluster, right? Um, you know, so going back to the dimension tables that I showed in the beginning, you know, say there was a dimension table on zip code. There's what, 40,000 zip codes in the US. That table's super small. It's only updated by the post office four times a year. So I can easily replicate that on, on every single node. So then now when I do my join, all the data I need from, the, from one of the tables is, is right there. And I don't need to communicate between the different nodes to send data around, right? So R, so R is partitioned on ID, uh, and I have one to 100 and one to one to 200, and then S is replicated. So that just means, again, there's a complete copy of the table S on every single node. So to do the join, each node does the join locally uh, on R and S, and then we need to coalesce the results. So say this node here will, will transfer its results to this other node, again, just unions them together and then produces the, the final result, the correct result. Again, if it's, if it's shared nothing, assume they have a local copy. If it's shared disk, then every node is going to pull, up, pull S up in, into, into its local memory or local disk. All right, next case scenario is when the, the tables are partitioned on, 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 the, on the join key and the partition ranges overlap. Right, so in this case here, R is partition ID, S is partition ID, and then although the ranges aren't the same, uh, if we make R the outer table, it will cover everything in an S. And because I'm doing an inner join and not like an outer join, I don't care that I don't have a match from you know from from 101 and above in in R because I only care about does R match into something into this, right? So again, th there's no data transfer. Every node has all the data that they need. I do my local join, send the result from one node to the other, coalesce them together, and I'm done. Right? So there's no intermediate transfer between, uh, between these two different nodes. But don't you have the, on the right-hand side, don't you, aren't you lacking 150, 150? And this is like, isn't this an inner join? So kind of, you kind of like left out some data, right? This question is, um, Aren't I potentially missing data here? Uh, that should be that's a typo. That should be yeah. Sorry, that's this is a typo. This should be this should be uh, this should be one hundred, right? So you would have a match. Yeah. Sorry. But then you're storing duplicates, then, right? What's that? Aren't you storing duplicates now, then? That's okay. okay. Potentially. Yeah, I'll fix it on the slide. That's a typo. That should be one one hundred. So again, it's an inner join, so I care about what's in, what's in, I, what's in, what's in R from 1 to 100 on the first node. I'm guaranteed if, if, if there's a tuple that exists, I will see it in S. Okay. All right, so the next scenario is when the, the tables are partitioned on different keys, right? And so the, what we're going to do is we're trying to figure out which table is the smallest between R and S, with the inner table and the outer table. And for the smaller table, we're gonna send that out, uh, a copy of it to, or the portion of the data that I have at my node to all other nodes in the cluster. So this is be called a broadcast join. Uh, this is typically used for, for hash joins. So if you ever see something called a broadcast hash join, or if somebody says broadcast join, it's usually a, a hash join that's doing broadcasting. So in this case here, R is partition on ID, and that's what, that's what we wanna, we want to do a join of that, but S is partitioned on value, right? So we can't do the join because we don't know whether the, you know, from SID one, is that going to be on this node or the other node, right? And we would have a false negative. So in this case here, because S is the smaller one, we're going to send a copy that I have to, from this node to this node, and then likewise, he's going to send me his copy. And then now I'm back where I was at the beginning, where I had a rep, you know, S was replicated every single node, right? And I do my local join. Every node produces its, its, its local result. First guy sends it to the second guy, and I coalesce it, right? 
So we had a transfer data, but we only had transfer data for S and not R. Yes? Question is, what is the, what is the, what is the objective of partitioning by value? Uh, like, why would I want to partition by value? Maybe there's like a thousand other queries that also do lookups on, on value, right? But this one query shows up and, and it, wants to, it wants to join an ID, right? So her question is, is a sort of larger question that we've been, we've sort of talked about this semester of like, okay, great, the relational model has this nice, nice abstraction where you don't really care how data is actually being stored or where it's stored. Uh, but then that means that someone's got to figure out what indexes to build, what how do I partition my, my, my indexes, or how to partition, partition my tables. So it's an empty hard problem to figure out for a given set of queries, what's the optimal uh, partitioning key for my table. And as I said before, even though it's optimal for most of the queries, it may be the worst thing to do for a bunch of other queries, and you still have to be able to support them. So in this case here, someone decided let's partition this table S on value, but the query shows up and it wants to, it wants to do a join on ID. So again, the database system ha is, will, will, has to figure out where the data is actually located and compute the result. There are some tools uh, that will try to figure out the optimal partitioning key for you, but again, it's not guaranteed to be the best, the most optimal thing for all possible queries. Okay. So the last scenario is, the worst case scenario, is when the both tables are not partitioned on the join key, and so I need to basically reorganize or shuffle, as it's called, a shuffle join, to, to re send out the data across all the different nodes so that we can then compute the join locally like, like we want. So in this case here, uh, R is partitioned on the name field or name attribute, S is partitioned on value, I want to join on the ID field, so I can't do this, this, you know, I can't do a local join yet. So I basically have to do a, a, a reshuffle, a repartitioning, so that I basically do a local scan, a uh, sequential scan on the data at each node, then partition it by ID, send out those buffers, send out the results or intimate results to the different nodes. All right, so R will go over here. This copy, copy of R ID within that range goes there. The R values within this range go here. And then I have to do the same thing for S. And then now I'm where I was before, where now I have the, uh, the data at, for R and S at each node matches up for my partition ranges. I compute the local join and then send, send the result over. Right? Yes? So you just like basically, based on the number of nodes you have, like figure out how to partition the join key between the nodes and then like only request the amount of data that you can fit on them? So, so statement is, uh, would you have to figure out how many, how many nodes you have to compute the, the join, figure out what the ranges of values are, and then send the data to those nodes? This is where hash partitioning makes this easier. Because I said, I have 10 nodes, so just 10, hash it mod 10, and that tells you where it needs to go. Yeah. Yes? Is this like typically chatted by some central node where it says that, okay, this node should be 1 to 100, so everyone who has 1 to 100 send data to this node? Or is this like a weird thing? Uh, so his question is, like, who's deciding at this, like, if I have to do a shuffle, who's deciding who gets what range? You would have a coordinator node. This would be like in the, the centralized planner, like the, the, the node that got the query does the parsing and then you know does, opti does runs the optimizer. It's going to figure out, oh, actually it would know the data that it wants to do with this join is not partitioned on my join keys. Therefore, I have to do this like shuffle step. So then it would, it would as part of the query plan, it would say, okay, well, this node's going to send the data to this node. This node is going to send it to this node within these ranges or it's hash partitioned that way, right? Um, that's what I, was, what I was saying before when I talked about like, if you send the query plan fragment that's a SQL statement, you could you can also instruct in the query plan, say, send, send the output of the scan or this portion of the query plan to this node, because they'll be waiting for you. And again, so this goes, this all sort of ties together now. When I was talking about this query fault tolerance stuff, like this shuffle, th this shuffle phase is not cheap, especially if the data is really big. And so if one node goes down, uh, if I've stored my shuffle, shuffle data, repartition data, you know, table uh, in some intermediate storage, then I don't have to go through that entire shuffle phase again. Again, think in extremes. Think of like 10 petabytes of data, and I have to, I have to do this shuffle thing. I don't want to have to do this every single time, and then a node goes down. Question? So 
So, you, so your question is, in this example here, why don't I partition, sorry, which one? Oh, so your question is, when I'm back here in the very beginning, yeah. why partition R and then partition S? Why not just partition R and then do my thing before where I, I broadcast S to everywhere? Right, so again, think of extremes. If this is 10 petabytes, this is 10 petabytes. Like, I, you know, I can't, I can't send, I don't want to send 10 petabytes to every single node. Right, the broadcast joint is going back here. Right, the broadcast joint is sending like S to every single node. I'm showing two nodes here, but I've had a thousand nodes. You know, this one node's got to send its, its copy of S, so it's portion partition S to 999 different nodes, right? So there's a lot of like transfer going on. In this case here with the shuffle, it's, it's, a, it's a targeted transfer. So like this thing, this node here would send only its portion of R to one other. So, well, it would send the, it would send the, the data that, that within its partition to the different nodes based on how, how they're being partitioned up after the shuffle, but the, I'm not sending a complete copy to every single node. I'm only sending like, okay, I know this node gets this portion, here you go. This node gets that portion, there you go, right? Whereas if it's, if it's, if it's the broadcast join, then it's, it's n minus one times tr you know, the, the, the data size transfer. Okay. So there's one optimization we can do for this um, in some scenarios called a semi-join. And the idea here is that it's, it's almost like vertical partitioning uh, or uh, projection pushdown, where instead of having to send the complete copy of a table from one node to the next uh, as I'm doing my, my join, um, I, can, I can send just maybe the portion of the data that I actually need to compute the join. And then the result I get back doesn't need to be the completely mere t complete materialized tuple. It's just the IDs, the, the primary keys, or the IDs that, I, that, that actually did match for the join. So let's say I'm doing a join like this where I join R and S on ID, and my output of the query just needs to be the R ID. I don't actually care uh, what, the values, uh, what, what value I have in, in S ID. I just need to know that there is a match. Right, and so if I, without a semi-join, the way I would have to compute this is that I have to send all S to this node and then all R to this node to compute the join and so forth. Right, but now you're actually sending up the entire, you know, the entire materialized tuple. But instead, with a semi-join, I really only care about is there a match at the other node for for my outer table for, for something in R. So it's essentially this query, right? Select R ID from R where there exists some tuple in S. The one just says, give me one, you know, it's basically true. Does this match if, if there's a join? So now when I want to send the, do the join in this other node here, I just send the RID column to, to this node. It does that join, which is basically matching this. And then I only send back the RIDs that match, not the entire tuple. So the, in, in SQL, there is not a semi-join uh, you can't, like, it's the same way you can declare an inner join versus an outer join. In most systems, almost all systems, you cannot declare that you want to, you, like, you want a semi join. And Paula does support this. Uh, there's another system that does, there's something from Microsoft that does this too. But underneath the covers, the query optimizer can figure this out and say, oh, I know you don't care about actually the result of uh, from, you know, the values from the inner table. So uh, it'll actually, they'll have a semi join implementation. Uh, that they can then use to, to minimize the amount of data transfer going from one node to the next. All right, so this is a very common optimization that you would have uh, in, in, in an OLAP system because, again, the network transfer is usually the most expensive thing. If it's in the same data center or the same rack, maybe less of an issue, uh, but certainly if, if you're going across the wide area network, it's going to be slow. And so the semi-join optimization is the way to go. So I want to finish up now talking about cloud systems. And uh, again, this is just sort of expose you to a bunch of, you know, if, you, if you read Hacker News or whatever, like uh, I, would, I would say Twitter, but Mastodon. Like, Twitter runs MySQL. Um, 
Yes, that's true. All right, so uh, the there's a there's a bunch of different. They sort of expose you to a bunch of these keywords that people are using now in a, in a modern cloud setting for, for databases. And again, the we talked about before where like there's you know the shared disk versus shared shared nothing, the pull of the data to the query uh, versus push the query to the data. The lines get very blurred in, in, a, in a modern system, so it's not always going to be clean divide for these things. So a very common uh, system approach now is to expose what are called database as a service offerings or products to, to users. And the idea here is instead of like you spinning up your own EC2 instance, downloading Postgres or MySQL, and, and you know, managing that yourself directly in the OS, instead, you, they will, you give them your credit card, and they'll give you a connection URL. A JDBC connection URL, whatever you want to use. And then now that the vendor is going to run the data system for you. You can't SSH into the box, but it, you know, for all intents and purposes, it, it is a database. From the application standpoint, it doesn't know, it doesn't care that it can't actually SSH into it. It just knows that here's the database I, I can communicate with. So there's basically two approaches to this. The first would be a managed database system. And this is where there's some vendor that is going to run like an off the shelf database system in a virtualized environment for you, uh, you know, give you a nice, nice UI and so forth, take care of maybe some backups or things like that. But they didn't make any modifications to the database system itself to be cognizant or aware that it's running in a cloud environment or running on S3 or running on EBS. Right? It just sees local disk, it sees memory, it sees compute. Uh, it doesn't know anything about the cloud, it doesn't know anything about maybe disaggregated storage. Right? So this would be like RDS from, uh, from Amazon, uh, GCP has Cloud SQL, where I think does take stock MySQL, stock Postgres, and you're running it inside a container, you're running inside a VM, and you know it's, it's just writing out the EBS as if it was local disk. There's another class of systems that fall under the term cloud native uh, database systems, and that cloud native is not a scientific term. Like I say, it has to have exactly these features to say it's cloud native. It's sort of a marketing term. Um, but the basic idea is that they've either written a system from scratch or have made heavy modifications to a, you know, what used to be an on-prem system, uh, uh, something you'd run in a managed database system, to now be cognizant of that, that is running in the cloud. And usually what happens is that it's switching over to a shared disk architecture uh, and maybe also being aware that there is local disk for, on like the EC2 node that can write, you know, there's a, a fast cache, and then it writes, uh, you know, it's, it's the primary sort of location of the database will be out on, on, on S3 or something. So Snowflake would be the best example of this. Uh, it probably was the first like distributed OLAP system built specifically for the cloud. Um, BigQuery is based on Dremel, which was an internal system that uh, Google developed. Um, that, that's sort of that's not saying it looks like Snowflake, but it's it's a it's meant to run in like a you know, in, in, in the local cloud infrastructure. Redshift is didn't start off being, I would say, cloud native. Uh, Redshift, Amazon bought a license to Parkcell, which was a fork of Postgres, a distributed version of Postgres from the 2000s. Uh, it was a startup that didn't didn't kind of go anywhere. Uh, Amazon bought a license to that, slapped it up. It was a shared nothing system. They made a ton of money on it, and then they realized, oh, we should probably make it look more like Snowflake. And then since then, it's it's been completely rewritten. Uh, to be cloud native, and then SQL Azure is uh, is is again the sort of hacked up version of um, of SQL Server that is made to be cloud native. So is one better than another? Uh, I mean, if you if you if your if your primary business is to run on the cloud, run your data on the cloud, and not support on prem, you'd want to start with this approach here, right? Snowflake does not sell an on prem version; they only sell it in the cloud. All right, so another term that's being thrown around is these, these what are called serverless databases. So typically when people think of serverless, uh, you think of like Amazon Lambda functions, right? There's this, there's this way to install like a function into AWS, uh, and then there's an endpoint URL you, 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 you send data to. It then fires up you know, your function in a container, runs it, sends back the results, and then the container dies and goes away, right? So we apply the same, same idea to a database system, but of course, a serverless database system doesn't make sense because you kind of need a server to run a database, right? Like it, it doesn't exactly make sense. Or, you know, it, it, superficially, it doesn't make sense, but basically what it just means is that they're, they're able to turn off the compute layer. So let me show you what I mean. So say I was running on either a shared everything or a shared nothing system 
right? When the application sends a query request, it lands on this node, it does you know, process the query, and sends back the result. But then now if like the application goes away because like the user falls asleep, goes to the bathroom, checks the phone, whatever, right? The since the this, the node is storing the data uh, you know at its this location, I have to keep this instance up, right? I, I provision it, it's gotta run forever. So the, the clock is running on this, even though I'm not running any queries, I'm paying for the compute, I'm paying for the storage, because uh, it's waiting for the next request to show up. So in a serverless architecture, again, it's typically when, well, I, don't, I think it always is, separated compute from storage. So now uh, I run just like before, when I run my queries, it goes to the node, the node gets the data needs from the shared disk, and sends back the result. So then now when these guys fall asleep, and I don't run any more queries, I can, I can kill this compute layer, right? I can, I, you could terminate the VM, I would, you know, if it was easy to, or you, just, you turn off the pod on Kubernetes, right? But because the, the state of the database is stored in shared disk, I can flush out the, what's in my buffer pool and page table, like the sort of intermediate state of the system, flush that out to shared disk, kill this compute node, I'm no longer paying for it, I still pay for, for the, the, the storage over there, because again, I don't want to delete my data. And then now whenever the application wakes up and says another query, I got to spin up the node, page back in the contents of the buffer pool to make it look like I never turned off. Then I run the query and, and then produce, produce the result. So this is an extreme example where you would literally shut down like the compute layer. Uh, and like I said, and you want to have this, this application state or the, the, the state of the database system as captured in the buffer pool, you want to retain that on disk and bring that back in. So you could kill the compute node. Oftentimes the case is that they will have, they'll run multiple customer node or multiple customer databases on the same node. So then you just, you flush out what pages belong to that customer out the disk and then page that back in, but this, the server is always still running. So this is becoming more common now. So there are systems like Fauna uh, and Neon, I would say were written from scratch to be serverless. Uh, Amazon has gone back and retrofitted like Aurora to, to have a serverless version. Um, same with Azure. CockroachDB and PlanetScale, same thing. They, they, they were originally not a serverless architecture, and they, they now provide it as an offering. And the basic idea is like, why pay for the compute if you're not going to run any queries? So they'll, they'll basically you know, turn your node off. Um, whether it's logical, physical, it, it doesn't necessarily matter for the application's perspective. So of course, the first query pays the penalty, right? Because if, if I go to sleep, uh, for an hour, you flush out my buffer pool. Next qu first query that shows up, you got to fetch that and bring that in. I'll have a higher latency for that, for this, for that first query because I'm fetching things from disk. Uh, and then subsequent queries that come immediately afterwards, uh, will, you know, will, they'll, they'll, they'll take benefits of things being hot in the cache. So this is a huge difference if, uh, or cost savings, if, if my not having the database all the time, then yeah, I could turn things off and I save a lot of money. But like if you're blasting it with a million queries a second, you pay you you pay a premium to get this architecture, and it's probably you're probably better off having provision instances. All right, so the, the next common uh, trend we see is in for OLAP systems for it's called data lakes. It basically, just means that there's some kind of centralized repository at, at your company, your your startup, your organization, whatever it is, that people can dump in all sorts of different types of data, like like structured data, the things that have been parsed semi-structured, maybe like log files or something, and unstructured data, like binaries, images, video. You dump these all into a centralized repository without having to define a schema ahead of time, or ingest them into the database system and convert them to the database system's internal format. And then I can come along and run queries on top of these files. And, and you know, as if it was a full data warehouse that has ingested things. So say that again, without a data lake, the, 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 the kind of system we talked about so far in a data warehouse, OLAP system would look like this. Before I can put any data into the database, I gotta call create table. The, this goes to the compute layer. It's gonna update the catalog and say, okay, now I know about table foo. It has these columns and these types, and it'll figure out where it's actually gonna store them on, on files or, 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 or disk in, in, the, uh, in the storage layer. And once I've done that, now I can call insert. Uh, the node's gonna look up in the, uh, in the catalog and say, okay, I wanna insert to foo. What, what do the columns look like? Where is it actually going to be stored? And then I can instruct the node where to actually write things, right? 
So same thing for select. I go to the catalog, and now I can do, you know, scan all these guys. So in a data lake, the sort of structured storage layer goes away. Um, like even though it's S3 and S3, it's you know, you're just you know, writing out blobs. The data system itself is responsible for what's what the binary format of what's putting into those blobs, and that that would be structured as defined by the schema. But the idea with now a data lake is that I have this I have these S3 buckets. It's got a bunch of SCSV files, JSON files, Parquet files, you know, column store files, whatever. And now when my select query shows up, this node still got to figure out somewhere from a catalog and say, okay, you want table foo? It's located in these files and these S3 buckets or these blob blob locations. Right? Maybe there's some information about what the scheme is. Maybe there isn't, right? But I go to this, this catalog service and say, what, where, where's the data I want? And then it, we know how to go to the data lake and get it. Yes? Wait, but if data lake allows like semi structured or you can unstructured data, does that mean you're no longer in a data format? This question is if, it's, if the data lake allows for unstructured and semi structured data, does that mean it's no longer in a data format? Yes. Or table format? Yes. Uh, so question, is it like MongoDB? No. So think of like even worse. Uh, <laughs> like think of like it's a directory in your local file on your local laptop. So it's like Google Drive. It's like 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 a Google Drive, like Dropbox, whatever the kids are using these days. Yes. But how would they interpret? Like how would you even translate like a SQL query into that? Right. So the question is, how do you actually translate a SQL query into something that that can hit up unstructured data? Yeah. Right. So you would potentially have to have either functions built in that can know how to, like, the data system may have to know how to parse CSVs, parse JSON, right? Uh, and there's, you would have to say, okay, if I'm looking for this column or this table and it's on these JSON files, if the JSON document, you know, each document is missing that attribute, then I ignore it, right? But if it's a bunch of random, random binary images, you, you would ignore that, right? So this catalog thing, this, like, I'm being vague, there's a catalog server that says, okay, you want this table foo? It's defined by these files in your data lake. There may be a bunch of other files that are like images or whatever, and it just knows to ignore them. Uh, what if instead of like this kind of system, you just build like a key value storage and then just throw back whatever binary data is responsible? So your question, statement is, instead of having this data lake approach, what if you had a key value store where you just, for a given key, you throw back data? Like literally the only API that the new warehouse provides is like you just click and get and then- That's S3. Or, or Azure Blob, yeah. But again, someone needs to like someone needs to understand the contents of what's inside them, yeah. right? So, a bunch of these logos you guys are probably familiar with: Snowflake, Databricks, uh, Google, BigQuery, Amazon. Trino is a fork of Presto, which came out of Facebook. Uh, again, I screwed this up. There's Presto DB and Presto SQL. They don't like each other because one Facebook owns one, not the other. And then, so the guys that aren't at Facebook, they made Trino, but they're, they're basically the same thing. Um, which one's better? I, it's unclear. Uh, and then Hive also came out of Facebook. Hive was doing SQL queries into MapReduce, which is a terrible idea. Facebook realized that, and then they, they built Presto. Um, but anyway, so like to, to his point, like someone's got to figure out what's actually in these files. And these different, uh, these, these, these OLAP systems know how to have, they have engines that can parse like Parquet, parse Orc, parse these different data files, and 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 then then run the SQL query on, on, on it as if it was you know if it was the system's internal format. Why is it a terrible idea to be SQL on top of MapReduce? The question is why why is it a terrible idea to be why is it a terrible idea to build SQL on top of MapReduce? Let's save that for next week. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, yes. Sorry for jumping back, but I'm wondering why. What is the argument for storing the raw data? So his question is, what's the what's the advantage of uh, storing the the raw data and then processing it on the node rather than pre-processing it once and then reusing it? Right. So that's the ETL versus ELT thing I said before. So like, you could like take unstructured data, like log files, like from from a, a web server, parse that into like the date field and so forth, right? You, you could do that and write out more, more files, but that assumes that the, you know, whatever the query is, is going to want that data sort of process that certain way. So the, the argument for the data lake is just put all your data here, and then everybody who wants to then consume this data 
could write their own transformation pipelines to convert the data to the format that they want. Again, and you could have your data scientists do some processing on, on, you know, to transform data and then put it back in and make it available to other people who then would, could discover your process data through, this, through, the, through, the, through the catalog. That's the, that's the dream. That's the, that's the, the vision of this. It, you know, it, at the end of the day, it comes down to humans. Like how, how good are your, 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 your engineers and your, your data scientists going to be about keeping track of the provenance of the data that they're writing out, making, you know, make, providing documentation for other people to use it, right? It's, it's hit or miss. And again, some, some, like, again, the advantage of this is like you, you could have your, you know, some part of your, your, your application, some microservice, writing about S3 file, files into S3, and then some other, some, something that's running like a, like a Presto or Trino could then just run SQL queries and parse it without having to first go and ingest it and start in the whole pipeline. You just plop it in S3 and then let everyone else you know, consume it. So that, again, there's, there's pros and cons. I'm not saying one is better than another. Um, it's certainly a lot, a lot faster if I just dump S3 files, or dump files in S3, don't define a schema, then worry about you know, how to keep the schema in sync between different versions of the files later on. Uh, you know, that'll be much faster than having to define the table ahead of time and, and do much work to clean things up to put it in. All right, so now, the, uh, we've been sort of dancing around. I've mentioned this a, a little bit already. Um, the, the, the data that we could be storing in a data lake or in a, uh, in a, in a, a an OLAP system, uh, it doesn't have to always be just text files or CSVs. So traditionally, most data systems have their own on-disk binary format for the pages, right? Think of like when, you, when you're on BusTub, it wrote pages out to disk, this little .db file, we should probably call it dot, dot bus tub. We should fix that. But there's a, there's a bunch of dot DB files, uh, and that's a proprietary format that only the database server knows how, to, how knows how to maintain. Actually, my favorite story about SQLite is uh, there's an internal file format that SQLite writes out the disk, and he he used to have it the the, the creator of SQLite used to have it be dot SQLite, but then he started getting phone calls from people because a bunch of different like applications were using SQLite, you know, for like. Think of like Photoshop or something like that, like desktop applications, and it would write out SQL, dot SQLite files, and then the system would, you know, the application would crash. Nothing to do with SQLite, right? The application was buggy. It would crash, and then the the, the user would then look in their, the local file and see a bunch of dot SQLite things and assume that was the problem. So then they found his phone number and would call him and complain about SQLite, right? He's like, I don't know what you're talking about. So in the code, you can see it where he, the temporary file is is dot and then SQLite spelled backwards. Right, et whatever, like il, and that prevented people from calling him because they don't know what it is. Uh, but anyway, but that's like yeah, that was the, that's like the SQL lab proprietary format. Postgres has its own proprietary formats. Like everyone has their own thing. So the problem is now, if I want to share data between these different systems, I got to take it out from the SQL lab format or the or the, or the, the the DuckDB internal format and then convert it uh, through some process into another internal format so that other some other data system can consume this, right? Or alternatively, I just write about, uh, write about as a bunch of CSV or JSON files or XML files, but that's going to be slow because you're taking binary data, converting it to text, and then have to convert it back into binary data. So the, they're not really new anymore. It's, it's over 10 years now. Um, but there's a bunch of these open source binary file formats that these systems can natively consume and, and generate so that I could write out a bunch of these files from my one system, write them to S3, and then have my some other system know how to, 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 to consume them and run queries on them. So the most famous one is probably Apache Parquet. And this came out of Twitter and, uh, and uh, Cloudera. Orc is one that came out of, of Facebook and Hive. They're essentially the same thing. But think of like it's a, it's a, it's a columnar format that is compression. Um, it does zone maps, a bunch of other things, right? And the idea is that they have this standardized format. Then they have a bunch of different um, Client libraries have written different languages, like, like Rust or, or Java or C++, that you can then use to consume and, and you know, get the data out of these things and write them. Um, Carmen data came out of Huawei. Uh, this might be not a scam, but it doesn't work. Uh, and I don't think anybody uses it. What? Like, like, you try to run the code, it doesn't work. Um, so so, so all right, that just means like, the open source version might be different from the, what they have internally. 
but the open source version doesn't work. Iceberg came out of Netflix. Uh, this is uh, this is Parquet plus uh, some additional um, additional files that for for ingesting data. Right, because these these file formats are, are write once read read uh, write once read many. Meaning, like once I create the Parquet file, I can't make incremental updates to it. Right, because again, think of like S3. I can't make fine grained changes to to an S3 bucket. I, it's either put it or get it or delete it. So I'd want to generate this, this, the, one of these Parquet files and just write it all out, all out. And if I need to make incremental updates, you would use something like Iceberg to, to keep track of these things and then merge it later on. Uh, HDF5 is an older format from the 90s. Uh, this is primarily used in like HPC or scientific workloads. I think of like the, the Hadron Collider, you, you, know, you would smash them, whatever, atoms, and then it would produce a bunch of these, these, these measurements. And it would, it would be in HDF5. Um, and Apache Arrow is a newer one that came out of Pandas and Dremio. And this is for any memory representation of columnar data. And the idea here, which is kind of cool, is that you could store your data uh, in memory in, in the Arrow format and either do fast transfers over, over the network to send it to another node or potentially have another uh, process running on the same, same, same box as you peek into your memory and know how to consume the, the Arrow data directly. Again, without, without having to serialize it or copy it out. So uh, Parquet and Orc, Parquet is probably the most common one out of all of these. Um, and then Orc is probably the, 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 the second most common one. And again, all these different OLAP systems will have their own connectors or know how to, how to parse these things and consume them. <coughs> the other things we've talked about so far uh, is how to break up the system even further. We talked about system catalogs. H catalog is the most common one that came out of Hive. Uh, again, I think it's, it's the metadata about the data, like where the data is located, what format it's in. Uh, some, potentially some, some additional statistics. But Google and Amazon and Microsoft have their own uh, catalog services. To run the nodes, uh, it's Kubernetes is the hottest thing now. or It's a de facto standard, so everyone uses that. But then the cloud guys have their own stuff. And then we didn't really talk about query optimizers as a service, but uh, in some systems, uh, since building query optimizers is super hard, instead of everybody replicating this process over and over again, People, have, I try to pull out and extract out the query optimizer, make it be its own standalone thing, so I could build a new database system that could reuse one of these query optimizers to parse the SQL, generate a query plan, and then I just have an engine that can actually run that, that query plan itself. So uh, the most famous one is Calcite that came out of LucidDB. LucidDB was a startup that failed, but the, then they, they pulled out Calcite, and that became the uh, you know, optimizer as a service. Orca came out of Greenplum. Uh, Calcite's, calcite's more common, but Orca is, uh, Orca, Orca is another alternative. Again, so in theory now, you could kind of build your own OLAP system by like reusing this piece and this piece and this piece and kind of like munge it all together uh, in a cloud service without having to write everything from scratch uh, over and over again, which is kind of cool. Okay, so uh, just to finish up, I think the, there's a lot more activity and a lot more money sloshing around in the OLAP market than there is in the OTB market. And I think the cloud has made this so much easier. So there's a lot of vendors, they're all hiring, uh, and there's a lot of interesting problems still on in this space. But of course now, you have a lot of money, you, you get a lot of data, and it makes things a lot harder. Uh, so go, go get jobs and help these guys out. All right, so. Why there's more money OLAP? The question is, why is there more money in OLAP and OTP? Because there are more people looking to, to ramp up their OTP, or sorry, their OLAP, uh, data solutions than OTP, and, and that's because it, it, it's those legacy applications and new applications, they, they, they want to get OLAP stuff up, right? In OTP, people are way more conservative about tr running transactions. Like if I'm a 100-year-old you know, bank, I have I, my IMS database is running all my transactions. It's been that way since the 70s. If, if it works, I don't want to touch it because if I break that and I can't run transactions, I can't make money. So they're more, uh, they're more um, open to new OLAP systems than OTB systems, OK? All right, so next class. They'll, they'll be the last lecture. Uh, and then next week will be all the fun stuff. So we'll talk about embedding application logic into the database server. And I will fully admit that this is, I'm going to tell you all these cool things you can do. I think it's the right thing to do. But when you go in the real world, nobody actually will do it, OK? So enjoy that. Hit it. Day cold, taking this toll. I got a pack.
cause zigzags, but ain't got nothing to roll. Hit the bus spot, let me cop a duck, show some love. We for 50 years, you with me, what I'm speaking of. I'm in the studio at nine, so it's some. And I'm not leaving till I'm finished with my next song. Fucking with that dope, you know it make my legs flow. Just grab a double deuce or two and then I'm good to go. Yo, I get this shit done and get it over with. Cause the whole world's waiting for another Tears Town Street sound. Clown a motherfucker if you label me a fake. I'm like a cobra and I'm down with the super snakes.